Good morning. Uh, I have the pleasant duty to chair and also introduce uh, the session speaker, a very distinguished speaker who is not new to NIAS. Uh, we have had the pleasure of listening to him many times before at training programs like this. Um, Dr. Anil Razan, uh, who is going to talk about fossil fuels and challenges uh, today, uh, was the Secretary of Power and Special Secretary uh, <coughs> the Department of Petroleum and Natural Gas to the Government of India. He also worked as Joint Secretary Power Director Energy Management Center, which is now the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, um, all with the Central Government of India. He was also Principal Secretary of the Go Government of Haryana in the Irrigation uh, uh, Power and PWD Department, besides serving as the Chairman of Haryana Power Generation Corporation. He was uh, Chief Administrator of Haryana De Urban Development Authority and Director Town and Country Planning, Director School Education, Director Public Relations and Tourism, and Press Secretary to the Chief Minister. You can see uh, he has a very distinguished and a very diverse uh, portfolio in, during his career. He has been the Chairman and Managing Director of the Northeast Electric Power Corporation and the Board Member of Oil and Gas um, Corporation, a Gas Authority of India, Indian Oil, Power Grid, National Hydroelectric um, Power Corporation, Rural Electrification Corporation, and so on. He has also been associated with some uh, other initiatives in the energy sector, so we, we couldn't ask for a better person than him to talk on the subject. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in initiating the 50,000 megawatt initiative on hydropower in 2003, and was also uh, instrumental in ensuring capacity addition of nearly 60,000 megawatt between 2007 and 2009 in India. Um, he's an alumnus of St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and has also been a visiting fellow at the University of Oxford for energy and development. Uh, I would not uh, spend more time and come between you and the speaker. Uh, he has a very long and a distinguished profile which uh, would take while to read it out, but without further ado, let me invite Dr. Razan to give us a uh, lecture for today's session. A very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure to come back to NIAS. And I think it's uh, uh, traditions, it's heritage, and it's association with, I think, some of the leading personalities in India's science and technology sector uh, humble you when you come to its portals. I have always valued my association here. I think it's my third or fourth visit to this institution, post-retirement. And uh, what I encourage is that I look at people like you who I may, may not have met in the course of my working career, but you're in the thick of it. Some of you, of course, I met where we all meet quite occasionally, wherever we are, either in the dining table somewhere, or maybe in a market, a vegetable market or a convenience store. But that's what it is. At the end of the day, we are all citizens of this country. We're all contributing in some way to growth of the country. And I think the onus on the very few people, the intelligentsia, is far greater than I think we have to date recognized. The subject of today's uh, talk is uh, science, technology, and energy and I think a focus on fossil fuels. You all come from a scientific background. I also had my basic training in science, but moved into law and public affairs and ultimately was fortunate enough to spend a major part of my career, civil service, serving the energy sector, both at the state at the center. Science is the mother of all principled education, of 
course, it's had its origins in philosophy. But I think moved away from philosophy because the strength of mathematics, strength of materials research, and strength of replicability. And when it went to the masses, it was technology which had to take that wealth of knowledge, principles of science into technology. But technology with what end? I think technology with the purpose of serving the citizen. Making profit and moving ahead of your competitors as a society, as a business venture, and also, I think, as an institution of development. This process, of course, has meant that there should be a protection of those intellectual rights or rights over property, your intellectual property. So that is your wealth. That's the wealth of a scientist or a technologist, which is very small as compared to the wealth of a commercial business house. But I think modern society implores one to look in that direction because prosperity, development are all equated to wealth today. We talk of some of the biggest names who are icons of technology and development, be it those in Microsoft, Apple, or rocket science, or anywhere. They're the icons for our younger generation. The newspapers today are filled with what kind of news? What is the startup salary that a young man gets? Your children look at those figures. You and I were brought up, at least my and Dr. Baldev Raj's generation, we were brought up in an environment which was not so materialistic, at least in India. But that probably is one of the reasons why we were intellectually very rich. We continue to be economically very poor. And that's why the majority of our country continues to be steeped in deprivation, even after gaining independence. Some of us were fortunate to have educated parents who could put us into good education. We had the benefits of good comforts of life. But these comforts are far remote, even in middle developed parts of India. Hence, there is little employment beyond agriculture and a strong shift towards urban centers. India will probably witness the largest urbanization in the years to come. Here is a challenge for all of us. And that is why I think we're meeting today. When I spoke to the course director this morning, I said <clears throat> I would be hopefully getting across some ideas to fire your imagination, to provoke you, to speak, to answer, to question. And I think to question the very relevance of our own contribution to the institutions we serve in the larger perspective. We all look very big in our own homes, in our own offices, in our own labs. But we've got to see where we stand in the national picture and the global picture. As individuals, we are very strong. But I think collectively and with the mission of economic development, we still have a long way to go. That is the purpose, 
I think of this gathering and this uh, course that you are undertaking. Science is behind a lot of technologies. And the other day, one of my nephews asked me for some reading. And I happened to run into a book which I handed over to him, How Things Work. Now everything is based on some principles of science, either physics, chemistry or biology, these being the basic sciences. How things work, yes, we all know. But then how do you translate that into technology and into fast-changing technology? The end user hardly knows how it all comes about. But at the end of the day, it is the product that he has in his hand, say the cell phone, is all that matters to him. And who is to provide this change, this transformation, to give power to the citizen to enjoy the benefits of life, to create jobs for the vast number of young people who are coming out. They cannot be absorbed in pure science. They can all not be absorbed in technology even. They will have to be involved in the economy of the country. Now what is the definition of science? I will not give it to you. You know much more science than me. But there's an interesting definition of technology that I ran into. And I thought I'll share that with you. Technology says, <clears throat> means processes by which an organization transforms labor, capital, material, and information into products and services of greater value. I repeat, technology means processes by which an organization transforms labor, capital, material, and information into products and services of greater value. Now that is the transformational role of technology. Technology cannot exist in a closed environment thinking I am the world. No, you are not the world. The world is much beyond you. Information overtakes you. And obsolescence comes very fast even to the leaders of technology. A classic example is the IBM, leader in mainframe computers. It lost out to small computing. And small computing is losing out to this handheld cell phone. Some of these changes <clears throat> have come through what is called disruptive technology. Technology which disrupts the way we have hitherto produced things or have acted. The other is innovation. How does disruptive technology also comes? It's through innovation. But on a parallel track is something called disruptive innovation. You may be going perfectly well on the path of technology, perfecting everything that you are doing, doing 99% purity, 99.99% perfection in what you are doing in your product. But the other end, there is a disruptive innovation that is coming, which will make your entire technology obsolete. This is called disruptive innovation. There are numerous examples of this. My generation came up in the old camera, the silver halide photography. Today, it's become obsolete. I used to be very proud owner of some good SLR cameras. They're junk. I haven't touched them for the last 10 years. Similarly, look at the gramophone records. We used to pride ourselves as children in the gramophone records. Next came those magnetic tapes. 
Then came CD. There were all kinds of talks. Today my daughter only uses a small pen drive. The iPod came in between and went. So obsolescence will overcome us faster than we think. And that is where I think we need to create a very fast link or step up between science, technology, innovation, disruptive technologies and disruptive innovation. We have to be prepared for change. And it's not peculiar to our country. I was reading somewhere that even in an advanced country like the US, not a single integrated steel company had by 1995 built a plant using mini mill te mi mini mil technology. And soon all that industry went into distress. The best producers. What is happening to automobiles? You have the BMWs of the world, you have Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce, everything Rolls Royce produced, the most perfect car in the world. Most people wanted to own it. But then, today, we are seeing that even these companies, be it Rolls Royce, be it BMW, be it Audis, they are facing a different global challenge. And that is the challenge of fossil fuel generated CO2 emissions, which are challenging the global environment. So your brilliance there, your need to chase up what your clients are saying on one track, you're a very honest guy. That is not going to matter maybe 10, 15 years later, unless you keep your vision open to somewhere else in the world. Now, paradoxically, there's something that disrupts our whole train methodology of working. You're asked to do what your clientele, that's your public, your customers want you to do. You do surveys. You're doing all that diligently. You're parts of large organizations with well-established bureaucracies, systems, everything. But all this in a way, the structure, like government is a perfect example, it constrains you from thinking out of the box. You've got to take too many sanctions, too many clearances. You as scientists know very well how long a paper takes to go, come back. Who clears it? No, 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 no. What are the end results? Is success guaranteed? No. Sorry. Out. Now, some small fellow sitting somewhere in an obscure market, not needing all these sanctions and just using his intellect, will discover and do something. Out of the advertising world even. And go and capture the market. The perfect example, which may happen, may not happen, is this 251 rupee cell phone that is being offered, giving features of what you are buying for 30,000 rupees. Not may, may not work, but God knows what plan he has in mind. And that could well swamp the entire market, the way you develop technology and the way you do things. I'm sorry I've devoted a little more time to this because I thought that we, what we need here for people like you is to change the way we think to react to what the younger generation is looking at us. They're looking at us as very ossified people, not open to new ideas, not open to change. I mean, one of the most valued chairmen of the Atomic Energy Commission that I liked was Dr. P. K. Iyengar, because I always thought that he had that jigyasa of a young college student at the expense of boring you and going off track I'll give you a small example he posed a few questions to me I was only a director in the department at that time now, I was talking to chairman of atomic Energy commission he says your answer your answer he knew I was a physicist by training I was taking my time to react he said tube light 
I said, sir, yes, but not an incandescent bulb. I didn't use the word like you. He just looked at me. He said, let's order some coffee. And he became a great friend. Another instance, he came back from a meeting, I think it was a scientist G selection. And you know, he came fuming, is this man knows nothing, absolutely is red in the face, pacing up and down the room. He'll be a disaster. He'll be, how can we put him to that place? How can we do this? And I kept saying, I kept saying, sir, no, sir, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. He looked at me. He said, what do you know about him? I said, I haven't even met him. Then, how are you saying all this? I said, sir, he's a scientist. He couldn't be so foolish as an IS officer. He's not an IS officer. <laughs> he said, again, let's order some coffee. So you see, you've got to be open. That's what I'm trying to say. You're all brilliant people in your own field, but look up to innovation. Look at what Japan did. I think Japan went like this, but then stagnated. Suddenly, too many procedures, too many systems, too much complacency, too large an organization. That freedom of thought, thinking, thinking out of the box, going into the wild with a wild experiment on marketing, that was lost. And that is why I think Japan stagnates. And this is something that shouldn't happen to us. Now coming to the link with energy. No development is possible without growth in energy. There are umpteen indicators to show that, whether it is human health development, education, economic progress, you name it. Now, India, unfortunately, has been quite low on that score. We have the latest International Energy uh, Outlook gives this figure, so I'm sharing it with you. 18% of world's population, 6% of primary energy consumption. And it has doubled since the year 2000. These figures are for 2015, mind you. It's the world's third largest economy, 1.3 billion people, but 240 million people remain without access to electricity. And 840 million people use primary fuels for cooking and others. Our per capita consumption in terms of oil, India, 0.6 TOE per capita. China, 2.2, US, 6.8, and the world average, 1.9. Now, 2040, India will contribute most to the increase in, in the global energy demand. This is what was worrying people. On the one hand, that India is growing, the other is, it's also an opportunity. Let's go and grab it. Now, whether it is in the, in the space of fossil fuels or it is in the space of renewables, looking at India as a market. But even then, by 240, we'll be 40%, below 40% of the global average. India will be the largest source of coal growth. It, has, it will be the largest share of oil demand growth. We are 3.8 million barrels per day in 2014. It will be 10 million barrels per day in 2040. Natural gas use will triple to 175 BCM, but still it will be only 8% of our overall energy picture. Indian power system, which is today we have a generating capacity of about, installed capacity of about 2.9. Uh, that's 2,90,000 megawatts. Now that figure is a little, uh, I should say, doubtful. Because the maximum peak demand that we can meet is only about 1,50,000. Either there are no connections, or the system as such is unable to put all that across to people to meet that peak demand. 
Now this is where the transmission system comes in. It's not enough to install a generating system. You can have millions of cars in the country, but if you don't have roads, what use are those cars? So it's not only the energy availability, energy end products, it is the infrastructure that you need which can utilize that infrastructure to the full. In fact, one of the most eminent speakers in oil sector, to my surprise, declared that the automobile is the most inefficient thing going. How? He said the richest use it for only maybe 5% in a day or 10% of the time in a day, rest it sitting idle. It's blocking space in a garage. And how much investment goes into it? Just for showing that I own this S-Class Mercedes or, or whatever it is. Now, India's primary energy dem demand fuel mix, again, I'm coming back to that subject. In the year 2013, our mix was, why we are talking of fossil fuels today, coal was 44%, oil 23%, and natural gas 6%. What does this add up to? Almost 73% of our total energy mix in the country is this. Nuclear is 1%, biomass 24%. Other renewables 2%. That's why we're talking of fossil fuels today. Now, what has happened, the shifting nature of energy demand in India. Earlier, we were using most of the energy in our homes and buildings, etc., etc., because of our large rural thing. When I say homes, buildings, I mean every little homestead, you know, whether for cooking or for doing odd jobs, fans, etc., etc. Now, between 2000 and 2013, there's been that shift in the economy. Industry has industrial use, whether power generation or industrial product, has overtaken domestic use. Now coming to oil sector, that is where one of our major source of worry is going to be. We do not have a large individual vehicle ownership. I'll give you some figures for comparison. In Japan, vehicle ownership was 550, it's assessed in 2013, per thousand population, out of which 450 were cars. In the European Union, it was 520 per thousand population, 440 cars. In China, 350 per thousand population, 80 cars. In India, 90 per thousand population, but only 20 cars which is not bad in a way, because we're using, seems more public transport, more two-wheelers. Electricity demand in India has grown almost two and a half, threefold from 2000 to 2013, from about 400 terawatt hours to about 900 terawatt hours in 2000. Electricity generation capacity, again, today, is about 60% coal, 15% hydro, 8% natural gas. Energy peaking and energy, uh, power peaking and energy shortages. When I was a joint secretary, they were hovering around <coughs> maybe 30%, 40%, and that was suppressed demands. Well, what happens when you can't meet it, just switch it off. So you don't know what the demand is. Today, luckily, they have come down to small digits, 3%, 4%, 5%, in that range. But what is dragging the sector down, although it's not relevant to today's talk of technology, but it is still very relevant for the survival of the sector. It is the health of the distribution sector. Because all the cash comes back from there. And unless the cash comes back, you cannot install more generation, you cannot more install more transmission. 
we have used energy in our country as a political tool now electricity petroleum natural gas these are two or three items which successive political governments have used to win over votes so to say at point of time when they need it there is another aspect that i wish to bring before you quickly and that is what is india's vision luckily india has begun to think globally over the last two decades or so and we have a vision which international experts tend to share also and i'll broadly share that vision with you you see at the moment our energy use per capita of the global average is 33% as i told you by 2025 we expect this to become 44% of the global average still less than half by 2040 when we should be one of the commanding economies of the world at least i will not be there you guys will be there be 60% hopefully by that time but still only 60% of the global average our percentage of fossil fuel consumption which is 5% in today it'll go up to 8% in 2025 and 12% in 2040 the power sector growth which we just talked about if it's 100 today be 220 in 2025 and 409 by 2040 now share of new renewables is so much talk of you see solar wind energy all these kinds of things the old renewable incidentally hydro is a renewable source but it's a conventional which we are not taking into account is only 5% in 2013 it is expected to go up to 13% in 2025 and 17% in 2040 you see when we talk of energy we not talking only of this electricity we even talking of all transportation fuels other fuels and you can never undermine the importance of hydrocarbons in the days to come I do not see aeroplanes running yet on solar power or such fuels maybe some biofuels I do not see our defense requirements ships etc other than nuclear powered fuels running on these sources of new renewables now share of new hydro renewables i told you rise from 5 to 13 to 17 and access to energy energy that is electricity is 81% in 2013 rise to 92% in 2025 100% in 2040 clean cooking 33% today will rise to 45% and only 70% in 2040 coal which we thought we are fully sufficient but no we are not for at least steel making etc 29% reports today 37% in 2025 and down to 31% in 2040 oil imports extremely worrying 74% today 83% in 2025 91% in 2040 natural gas imports 34% 2013 53% 2025 49% in 2020 in 2040 energy intensity which is how little energy you need for one gdp of development if it's 100 today as an indicator it will be 66 in 2025 45% a uh, 45 in 2040 co2 emissions which i'll just briefly touch upon here we have 6% of the global share of co2 emissions overall in 2013 9% in 2025 14% in 2040 
and CO2 per capita, we have only 30% of the global average then, 58% in 2025, and about 79-80% in 2040. This is the vision of India's growth. Now what happens if we continue to use fossil fuels the way we have been using? You've all been uh, reading about global warming. Because in, in the combustion of fossil fuels, what happens is that, you all know, I don't have to tell you, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 is the main culprit. And they say because of that, though historically also, there have been direct correlation between the uh, concentration of uh, CO2 in the environment and the temperature. The temperatures could rise by 6 degrees by the end of this millennium, which would be disastrous for the present kind of civilization. The whole effort is to try and maintain that increase to 2%. Now, how does that happen? It happens by stalling the growth of fossil fuels. Well, these countries, which have already saturated, they have diminishing populations, they have no problem. If you go for a low carbon growth, you go either for nuclear or for new renewables. Now, how much penetration? I've shown you in the estimation. So what do we do? We are luckily rich in coal. We may having third or fourth largest deposits in the world, but not pretty good in the sense that uh, they have about 30 to 50 percent ash. And the newer coals that we are going to mine have about 45 to 50 percent ash. And they are concentrated in a certain part of the country. They have to be transported long distances or you have to put electricity across all those distances. So the answer is that we don't use subcritical power generating technologies. We use supercritical or ultra supercritical and attain about 46 percent or so of energy efficiency in the burnout. That's one thing. The other is that we go for huge demand side management. That is the kind of electricity we use. Or the oil that we use, you have very strict controls and parameters. Lighting must move from incandescent to CFLs to LEDs. And how does this happen? When you buy in bulk, you create your own manufacturing capacities, these costs can even come down to one-third or one-fourth of what they are today. So at least lighting loads go down. Energy efficiencies in terms of air conditioning pumps, agriculture pumps. There should be no agriculture pump which is not star rated. We have a labeling program, Ajay Mathur will be Coming here today, I used to be his predecessor many years ago. We started a labeling program, which they've now perfected. He'll probably talk to you about it today. It used to be my director general of Bureau of Inefficiency. Efficiency. Now, we have to use star-rated pumps for extraction of water. They're power guzzlers. Automobiles, very strong cap on efficiencies. We have to Somehow, you know, our defense and economic vulnerability is going to be on oil imports. And the direction of vehicles. I think as our systems transform, we will have to move from these petrol driven vehicles, hopefully, into electric vehicles. At least in the local urban running short distances. And these electric vehicles and the use of new renewables, you have a special session on that, so I will not talk too much on that, but just leave it here with this thought that you are going to be prosumers, that is producer and consumer. And you can be banks of that renewable energy and feed back into the system. So the consumer is not only going to be a consumer, he's going to be a co-sharer in the whole process, energy. So demand side management, energy efficiency, these are the keystones. Now what happens to the huge amount of carbon dioxide that is there? 
We had a thought given globally, and I was member of that carbon sequestration leadership forum, that these countries which could not meet their Kyoto obligations, they said, shove it under the earth, let's store it there, capture it and shove it there. Or let's adopt other methods of reducing CO2. You can either pre-combustion uh, pre remove the CO2 or post-combustion. But all this will mean that electricity could become twice as expensive. Let's understand that. And I am one of those who is against storage of CO2. You must either utilize it, say in enhanced oil recovery, or fix it into a stable compound. That is, as far as I think fossil fuels are concerned, I thought enough to provoke you and hopefully you're going to bombast me with questions. Thank you very much.